lecture is on blood vessels, physiology, part two. In part one, we talked about the anatomy of blood vessels. So just a couple more things about that. An anastomosis, anastomoses with an S is singular, with an ES is singular. And if we added an IS to it, it would be plural. Oops. So an anastomosis is when blood vessels travel from one to many, that means they diverge, or they could go from many to one, meaning they converge. So you can see an example of that down here. This is called the circle of Willis. And the circle of Willis is uh, our arteries that circle the brain and they branch off into many. The purpose of this is to ensure a continuous circulation of blood to an organ. So again, an anastomosis ensures a continuous circulation of blood to an organ so that if one blood vessel gets clogged, there is another one also bringing blood to that organ. Now venous anastomosis are more common than arterial anastomosis, and there are lots of these in the body. So it's rare that someone dies of, a, of blockage of, to, to the veins. In the arteries, these are not as common, and you tend to find them around joints where when you move, those blood vessels get constricted, or around critical organs like the lung. Here you can see uh, an anastomosis uh, involving many arteries in the large intestine. So again, so far we've learned that the heart is a pump, arteries are the pipelines for blood, capillaries are the exchange sites, veins are also pipelines, but they are also reservoirs for blood. That is, at any one time, most of your blood can be found in veins. What we're going to talk about next is actually the physiology of blood vessels. And by that I mean what keeps blood moving through the circulatory system. So in order to explain this, I need to uh, define, make a couple of definitions. And the first one is blood flow, abbreviated as F. Blood flow is the volume of blood flowing through a vessel, such as the aorta, an organ, or the entire circulation in a given period of time. Now, of course, if it's blood flow through the entire circulation, that would be cardiac output. It's measured in milliliters per minute. Another term is blood pressure, abbreviated BP. And blood pressure is the force per unit area exerted on the wall of a blood vessel by blood. It's measured in millimeters of mercury. Now the reason for this is long ago, maybe not that long ago, we used mercury, and this is the symbol for mercury, in blood pressure cuffs and in sphygmomanometers, and also in barometers. And so I'm just going to show you how this works by showing you a simple barometer. You can see here we have a, a bowl, and the gray, the gray stuff here is supposed to be mercury. Here's a test tube turned upside down, so one end is closed, the other end is open. And again, we have mercury in the bowl. Now our barometer is actually used to make predictions about the weather. And what happens is the pressure in the atmosphere which is defined as PATM. So this is the force of all the gases in the atmosphere pushes down on the mercury and pushes it up the tube a certain amount, depending on how much pressure is in the atmosphere. The tube can have a scale which is in millimeters. Now remember millimeters is a scale of distance. So mercury is a very dense, uh, very toxic fluid that is silvery. 
And so it takes a lot of pressure to move it up this tube. When someone takes your blood pressure and they say your blood pressure equals 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, what that means is that the force of the blood on the walls of the blood vessel is the amount required to push mercury up a column 120 millimeters high. That's a lot of force. This would be the top number, this is called the diastolic pressure. The bottom number, the sorry, the top number is called the systolic pressure. The bottom number is called the diastolic pressure. So if the diastolic pressure is 80, that means that the force of the blood on the walls of the blood vessel is the same force required to push mercury up a column 80 millimeters high. And that's a lot of force because again, mercury is very dense, very heavy. Now the last term is called peripheral resistance. And it is abbreviated PR. Peripheral resistance is the amount of friction that blood encounters as it moves through blood vessels in the peripheral circulation. Um, peripheral means outside of the heart. So the inside of the blood vessel, the tunica intima, is fairly slick. There's not a lot of friction, but there is some friction. And the longer blood travels through the blood vessels, the more friction it encounters. Now, how do these three terms help us understand blood flow? Well, the, way, the best way to look at this is with a formula. Blood flow equals delta, this is a Greek letter delta, which means change in, change in blood pressure over peripheral resistance. Sometimes with a formula, you can answer all kinds of questions. In fact, the formula actually tells you the relationship between these variables. One thing you can do if you're not really sure is you can just put numbers in there and make up numbers and put them in and see what happens. So let me give you an example here. Let's say this is time one and this is time two. And at time one, the change in blood pressure, I'm gonna say is 10. And at time two, the change in blood pressure is 20. So my question is, what happens to blood flow if blood pressure goes up? So if blood pressure goes up, what happens to blood flow? And I'm going to leave peripheral resistance constant. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give it a value of five. Now these aren't real values, and you don't need to use real values. You're just trying to answer a question here. What will happen when blood pressure goes up? What will happen to blood flow? Okay, so flow at time one, flow at time two. Well, at time one, blood pressure is 10, peripheral resistance is five. 10 over five is two. At time two, we'll note, you'll notice that blood pressure has gone up. So now blood pressure is 20, peripheral resistance is five. 20 over five is four. So now we can answer this question. If blood pressure goes up, peripheral resistance stays the same, then force goes up, sorry, not force, blood flow goes up, okay? So if blood pressure increases, the flow of blood increases. And some, you, you don't even have to put numbers in here because both of these values are in the numerator. So they directly affect each other, they're directly proportional. If this one goes up, this one goes up. And likewise, if blood pressure goes down, blood flow goes down. What about peripheral resistance? Well, you can, you can use numbers and keep blood pressure the same, but increase peripheral resistance, or you can just take a look at peripheral resistance, which is in the denominator, whereas blood flow is in the numerator. So these two are inversely proportional. They're opposites. So when this one goes up, peripheral resistance, blood flow goes down, and, and vice versa. If peripheral resistance goes down, what happens to blood flow? Right, it goes up. Um, so again, um, you can see that the flow of blood through your body is dependent on blood pressure and friction. Let's take a closer look at blood pressure here. And these are two terms you've probably seen. So the first one is called systolic blood pressure. 
This is the highest pressure measured in an artery. The artery we're really talking about is the aorta, and it's a result of ventricular contraction or systole. So when the left ventricle contracts, it forces blood out into the aorta, and the aorta stretches. The pressure in the aorta at that point is called systolic pressure. It's usually around 120 millimeters of mercury. The number on the bottom, which is often 80, is called the diastolic pressure. And that's the lowest pressure measure, measured in the artery. So that's what happens when the ventricle actually relaxes. After it contracts, it relaxes, which is diastole. And there's still pressure in the aorta. It's around 80 millimeters of mercury. So this is what your blood pressure means when you see these two numbers. Now, pulse pressure is another term that's kind of important. Pulse pressure is equal to systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. So let's say that your blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. What would your pulse pressure be? Well, systolic is 120, diastolic is 80. It would be 40 millimeters of mercury. That would be the pulse pressure. More importantly, the pulse pressure is the throb you feel when you take your pulse. So what happens is when the ventricle contracts and shoots the blood into the aorta and it stretches, it's going to then recoil. And that stretch and recoil creates pressure waves that travel from the aorta down through the major arteries all the way to the radial artery. And you can actually feel that and use it to measure heart rate. So the reason it's important is first, you can use it to measure heart rate in beats per minute. But the other reason is that it is an important measure of the maximum stress exerted, exerted on the small arteries by these pressure surges generated by the heart. So if you think about it, let's take this example. Let's say we have two patients here, person one and person two. And person one has a blood pressure of 140 over 60. And the second person has a blood pressure of 140 over 90. Which one is a better blood pressure? Traditional medicine would say this one because at least the diastolic pressure is lower. But if we were to calculate the pulse pressure of person one, it would be 80. The pulse pressure of person number two would be 50. So that means person number one would be worse. Person number two would be better. One way to think about this is when there is a huge difference between the aorta as it stretches, which is a measure of diastolic pressure, and then when it snaps back, when you have a big difference between diastolic and systolic, there is more stress exerted on the artery when there, than when there is less of a difference between the two. So the lower pulse pressure is better. And physicians now think that pulse pressure is a powerful predictor of heart attacks, heart failure, and overall mortality. If you look at the human body, there are several places that you can actually measure pulse pressure. And this, this picture is showing you the places. Here's the radial artery, which is usually where people take pulses. Um, here is the brachial artery where people usually are taking blood pressure. But there is several other places you could also measure that. Now there's another term which is used more commonly in hospitals called the mean arterial pressure or MAP. The MAP is a calculated average pressure in the arteries and that's what mean means, the average. There's a formula for it which is MAP equals the diastolic pressure plus the pulse pressure over three. So for an example, let's say your blood pressure is 120 over 80. Then the, the mean arterial pressure is going to be the diastolic pressure, which is 80, 
plus the pulse pressure, 120 minus 80, that's 40, over 3. And this comes out to be about 93 millimeters of mercury. So this is the average pressure on the arteries of somebody who has this particular blood pressure. Why is this important? Well, it's another measure of the maximum stress exerted on arteries. It is also an indicator of the risk of cardiovascular disease and kidney failure, syncope, which is another word for fainting, and aneurysms. Okay, so let's continue on talking about blood pressure here because there are many factors that affect your blood pressure. Now, one formula for blood pressure is blood pressure equals systolic over diastolic pressure. But another formula is blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance. So if I asked you to describe one factor which affects blood pressure, you could say, well, if the cardiac output increases, the blood pressure increases. Now remember, cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped out of each ventricle in a minute. So the more blood that's pumped out, the higher the blood pressure. Likewise, if cardiac output decreases, then blood pressure decreases. You could also focus on peripheral resistance. If peripheral resistance increases, then blood pressure increases. So the more friction there is on the blood vessel, the more the blood pressure. Another factor that affects blood pressure is the blood vessel diameter. Now remember, um, the diameter has to do with the size of the lumen. So let's look at a typical blood vessel. Let's say this is what it looks like. And the diameter is the distance across the lumen. If we decrease the diameter, so let's say this is what happens. And you can see that the diameter has decreased. What's gonna happen? Well, the same amount of blood is trying to force its way through a smaller space. So that means that more blood is going to come into contact with the wall of the blood vessel, and there is going to be a greater peripheral resistance. Well, the more friction, the greater the blood pressure. So when the diameter of a blood, a blood vessel decreases, the blood pressure increases because of an increase in friction. What if, instead, the diameter of the blood vessel increased? Well, now, the blood is flowing through here, but there's not as much blood, so it's not pushing on the sides as hard. So if the diameter increases, then the friction is gonna decrease, which means the blood pressure decreases. Another important factor in affecting blood pressure is blood viscosity. And viscosity is essentially the thickness of blood. Think of it as thickness. So for example, think about molasses. Molasses is a very viscous, very thick fluid. And then think of water, which is not very viscous. So if you were to try to force molasses through a small pipe, it would take a lot more force than if you were trying to force water through the same pipe because there is more friction. So if viscosity of blood, in this case, increases, then your blood pressure is gonna increase. And it's going to increase because of increased friction. There, an example of this would be a disease called thrombocytopenia. So thrombocytopenia is when people make too many platelets. They're, so their blood is more viscous, and that means that there is more friction and the blood pressure goes up. Another factor affecting blood pressure is the total blood vessel length. If we took a, a little tape measure and measured all of the blood vessels in the body, that total length affects blood pressure. If the total length increases, your blood pressure is going to increase because as blood travels further along through these blood vessels, the peripheral resistance increases. 
In other words, there's more friction. When does this happen in real life? Well, in people who are obese, they increase their total blood vessel length. And the reason for this is they have more fat in the body. Fat is a tissue that also needs oxygen and nutrients. And so more blood vessels form to serve that fat. And so the total blood vessel length is greater. Thus, the blood pressure goes up. Another example is pregnancy, although this is, doesn't always happen. In pregnancy, because of the fetus, there's an increase in total blood vessel length. Usually in most women, homeostatic control mechanisms are able to prevent an increase in blood pressure, but not always. Another factor that affects blood pressure is blood vessel elasticity. Now remember that blood vessels have some elastic or elastin in them, which allows them to stretch and snap back. When blood vessels stretch, they absorb some of the pressure. And so if there is a decrease in elasticity, then the blood pressure is gonna go up. And the reason it goes up is because there is more friction. There's more friction because the blood vessel cannot expand to absorb some of that pressure. And an example of when this happens is in arteriosclerosis. Now remember, this is the disease in which individuals, um, the elasticity or the elastin is damaged and the arteries become rigid. And so there is more peripheral resistance and so the blood pressure goes up. This becomes kind of a, a vicious circle because as the blood pressure increases, it causes more inflammation of the tunica intima, which causes more damage to the elastin which causes more rigidity. So it's kind of a positive feedback mechanism. Now lastly, the last thing I'm gonna mention, and there are other things that affect blood pressure, but these are some of the major ones, is blood volume. Most adults have about, or most females have about four to five liters of blood total in their body. Most males have about five to six liters. If the blood volume goes up and there's more blood going through your blood vessels, the blood pressure is gonna go up. And the reason for this is an increase in friction. Now, when could this happen? Well, uh, it could happen because somebody has a very salty diet. Now, wherever salt goes, water follows. So that would increase your blood volume, which would increase your blood pressure. An example where blood volume might drop would be blood loss. So if there is, for some reason, is a huge blood loss, for example, an accident, then the blood volume is going to drop, and that will result in a drop in blood pressure. When you, we think about all of these factors, one of the things you'll notice is that no matter which one we're talking about, the reason always seems to be a change in the peripheral resistance, and in fact, the major driver of increase in blood pressure is peripheral resistance. So what I would like you to do is explain two factors that affect blood pressure. List the relationship first. So you could say something like um, an increase in total blood vessel length increases blood pressure. Then explain the how. How does it do that? And provide an example. So I'd like you to do this and submit your answer on Canvas. And this will be good practice for, um, for writing an essay question. But what are the normal standards for blood pressure? Well, according to the National Institute of Health, normal blood pressure is less than 120 over less than 80. So you'll notice the less than. It is no longer 120 over 80. Health professionals want you to be as low as you can be. If your blood pressure is in the range of 120 to 129 for the systolic pressure and 80 to 89 for the diastolic, you are said to be prehypertensive, which means that you are on your way to getting high blood pressure. Usually, the recommendation is to have less saturated uh, foods or less saturated fats and exercise. If the blood pressure 
the systolic blood pressure is 140 to 150, and the diastolic pressure is 90 to 99, patients are said to be in stage one hypertension. Now again, the recommendation is going to be the similar as above, less saturated fats in the diet, exercise, but they might also add medication, such as a calcium channel blocker, which blocks the calcium channels in smooth muscle cells in the blood vessel and causes them to relax. So this causes an increase in the diameter of the blood vessel, which drops your blood pressure. Stage two hypertension is when the uh, systolic pressure is 160 plus and the diastolic is 100 plus. So this is getting to be somewhat of an emergency. Um, this could result in a blood clot or an aneurysm. And so now the recommendations are the same as above, but they might add in a diuretic. And what a diuretic does is it increases urination and that water in your urine is coming from the blood. So actually, what's happening with a diuretic is that you are decreasing your blood volume. And as blood volume goes down, blood pressure goes down. And this happens fairly quickly. Now this last statement, now that you are all experts about blood pressure, I would like you to interpret this for me. And also when you're writing up your two facts or two factors that affect blood pressure, I'd like you to translate this for me um, in layman's term. People who are normotensive at age 55 have a 90% lifetime risk of developing hypertension. This is according to the National Institute of Health. So I'd like you to just explain what that means.